Our next speaker, Dave Tubison, uh, basically started his uh, academic career at uh, MIT, and uh, he ran into the uh, Botstein dictum that, uh, that Louis Chodosh referred to, we don't want to train your kind, uh, in, a, <laughs> in a course that Botstein had initiated, Project Lab, also known by some as Death Lab, where folks like Richard Mulligan and myself uh, would uh, take the projects of the postdocs in our lab and give them to undergraduates and try to strike the fear of God into the uh, postdocs in the lab saying, listen, this, this kid's going to finish your project if you don't. So that <laughs> happened. And Dave was a uh, chemistry major here, not really completely sure what his goals were in life. And he showed up one day at Project Lab when we were starting it and said, can I take it? I'm a chemistry major. We asked him, do you know, do you know anything about biology? And he said, well, not really. So we took him. And <laughs> And it turned out he, he was pretty good, and uh, somehow we snuck him past the Botstein barrier, and he became an MD-PhD, which he took uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins and did some pretty interesting things there, and then came back here to Tyler's lab, where he's now a, a postdoc, and uh, I won't make this too long just to say he was uh, a stellar postdoc in Tyler's lab and did some fascinating things that uh, in, at the same time as preparing for his boards, we, we taught him how to multitask and he was adept at it. I won't tell you details of all of that too long. But uh, then he went on to uh, University of Pennsylvania on the faculty and moved in uh, 2006 to the Cambridge Research Institute, where he's a senior group leader, and he's going to talk to you today about oncogenic KRAS, something he's been involved with for quite a while, models in medicine. Dave, you're on. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for the invitation to Angelica and Phil. It's a big honor, um, not deserved. Um, coming back to MIT brings back a lot of memories, but this room, my biggest memory was seeing a very troubling film called Clockwork Orange. <laughs> and um, many of th those things which happened in the film I have since experienced in different ways. Um, <laughs> never as a perpetrator, nor as a victim, but as watching life go for the last 25 years. Um, but. Uh, as you heard, we're not supposed to reminisce much, and so I will do it vicariously. Um, and so when Richard Nixon signed the War on Cancer um, Act in 1971, it was because he was suffering a personal tragedy in his family, but also because the families of many who had died before had come to Washington. And patient advocacy is one of the great things which has changed things uh, for folks with different health problems in our country. A movie came out when I was actually doing my postdoc, which I was unaware of until recently, um, but it had a pertinent quote um, uh, from Tommy Lee Jones. What is a pancreas anyhow? I mean, I don't know what the damn thing does for you besides give you cancer. <laughs> now, the last speaker, uh, Louis Chodish, being a proper endocrinologist, might disagree with that quote. Um, but in any case, that's the type of fear that people have about cancer, and particularly this one. We have about a quarter million people dying a year of pancreas cancer in the Western world. About 10 to 20% of folks get an operation in some places. Um, those are the few people who can be saved, um, but only a fraction of them actually are saved because the disease come back, comes back, as you heard from uh, Lewis, uh, in breast cancer. The incidence is basically the same as mortality. So it's a bad one. And um, when I was uh, training um, part-time as a medic here, uh, I became interested in this disease because my patients all died. And so it wasn't a particularly scientifically just rationale for going into it. Um, but I was fortunate in that other scientists had been working on this disease for some time. And a cartoon was put together due to a compilation of that work which shows a potential putative progression scheme for this disease showing an accumulation of mutations 
along with histological alterations, turning a normal pancreatic ductal, ductal epithelial cell into an invasive cancer. The Kirsten Rasp um, oncogene is mutated in virtually all cases of ductal pancreas cancer, making pancreas cancer very different from many other types of carcinomas in that you have a dominant oncogene um, for which we have uh, very ineffective therapies. And you potentially have a more homogeneous genetic disease than some of the other carcinomas also. But in any case, there's this progression scheme of an oncogene followed by various tumor suppressor genes which are mutated. Um, and this was the knowledge that we had um, when I was able to convince um, my cross-dressing boss here, uh, Tyler Jacks, to uh, work on uh, pancreas cancer. The fact that he's a cross-dresser means he has an open mind. Um, and it's a good thing because, as you've heard, I was damaged goods um, coming in with multiple career ambitions. And so Tyler really um, deserves uh, you know, all of the credit for uh, taking me on as somebody with an immunology and medical background and chemistry background, teaching me uh, the principles of cancer biology and cancer genetics, enabling the construction of a variety of mutant mouse strains, which eventually were used to generate models of early and advanced pancreas cancer. Along the way, I was helped to a great extent by uh, my first uh, postdoctoral fellow, Sunil Hingarani. And with Sunil, uh, the strains we made uh, in Tyler's lab, we were able to utilize a particular strain of mouse that had a point mutation in KRAS and a point mutation in P53 and generate a survival curve you see in red where the animals die in four and a half months with some variability compared to just a RAS mutation where they get uh, pancreas cancer more slowly. And importantly, these animals developed a pancreas cancer syndrome. Um, they had cachexia, wasting of the muscles on their backs, just like the patients we have in the clinic who are sick with end-stage carcinomas. Uh, they had malignant ascites and metastases you could see with your eyes to the relevant sites, the liver, the lungs, the, um, the diaphragm, the mesentery, et cetera. And so with this knowledge, we, uh, we, we built this model so that we could learn why is it that the medicines we have for patients with pancreas cancer are, are, are so pathetic. Um, and as you heard from Ed uh, Clark very recently, medicines are tri tried in patients because of preclinical data, which comes from academic as well as private sector sources. Um, many of the experiments that we do in the preclinical setting have been non-predictive of what occurs, though, in the clinic. And so Ken Olive, who is an F2 from Tyler, uh, meaning he did his graduate work with Tyler on Leaf Romani, uh, actually came to my lab to help set up a preclinical therapeutics program, which is what we were attempting to do. Due to a variety of reasons, we had to do this on foreign soil um, in Cambridge. And the approach which evolved over time is shown here, where the animals were enrolled in treatment strategies once the tumor reached a certain si size. Um, and then variety of uh, treatment strategies were undertaken. In this first case, we just wanted to compare the standard of care for uh, pancreas cancer in America and worldwide, which is gemcitabine, using transplantation models, be they orthotopic or subcutaneous xenografts or allografts, and compare that to a genetically engineered model that I showed you a picture of. And that simple question, which took actually several years and um, legions of, of various other things, um, gave a, a, a very simple result, actually, which is that in all the cases using a transplantation model, the tumors when treated with, when the mice were treated with salt water, the tumors all grew, shown in blue, compared to when gemcitabine was mixed in the salt water in red. And so you always had tumor growth um, and, and sta stabilization of that growth when you treated with gemcitabine in the transplantation setting. But if you had this primary cancer model, the genetically engineered mouse, the opposite happened. You treated with salt water, you had the same result as treating with the same dose of maximally tolerated gemcitabine. Gemcitabine is a nucleoside analog. It needs to be phosphorylated three times to be an active drug. Um, and it, and it, it is the standard of care because about 10% of folks have a shrinkage of their tumor when they're treated with gemcitabine, and there's a slight prolongation in median survival and an increase in the quality of life during treatment. But the results are obviously very minimal. And so Ken sought to understand this dramatic difference between the two model systems. The um, tried and true transplantation models used by the FDA to um, credential drugs and these genetically engineered mice. 
And there was a variety of assays he used to look at this. One is shown here, where I hope you can appreciate there's green tissue on the outside, a big blue hole in the middle. This is an experiment where we're using doxorubicin, the breast cancer drug you heard about um, uh, from Lewis uh, and others, as a fluorophore, and infusing it into the animal and seeing that the drug does not get into this tumor, shown here in H&E, but does get into the normal tissues. This is the genetically engineered mouse. The transplantation tumor is bright green because the drug gets in. And uh, I'd say in support of that, when one measures gemcitabine triphosphate, the active moiety, you can measure it in this tumor, but not this one. And so these were the basic observations which came um, from this in first foray into the work, and we had to understand why this was occurring. And so Ken looked at um, this basic metabolism of gemcitabine importation phosphorylation, exportation, could not find any differences in these mechanisms between the two models. But rather, when he used non-invasive imaging and histological analysis, the answer became very clear. And so this is an ultrasound image of a tumor under the skin, a transplantation model. Here's the pancreas tumor growing out of the pancreas. The green bubbles you see are a contrast ultrasound, a contrast agent the size of a red blood cell. So this approximates the active blood volume. So you see blood in this tumor, not in that tumor. Using an MRI to uh, look at the uh, chemical environment of the proton, you can't tell these two tumor types apart, but if you infuse gadolinium DTPA, which is another 500 molecular weight small molecule, and collect the dots over 10 minutes, you get a dynamic uh, scan. And so this dynamic scan shows you a big rim around the tumor with a black hole in the middle. And here's the tumor under the skin, which lights up brightly. And so you're able to get small molecules in be they the size of uh, big things the size of a red cell, small things the size of gadolinium DTPA, if you're under the, a tumor under the skin, but not if you're a, a, a primary cancer growing out of the pancreas. 